The day comes when a highly advanced extraterrestrial civilization sends to Earth a subatomic artificial intelligence, which covers the planet like a dome to slow down the scientific progress of humanity. You've got me because they let you. You have no idea what they can do. The year is 1966. In China, a young physicist named Wen Jia witnesses the murder of her father, accused of counter-revolution and belief in God. She herself is arrested. London, 2024. A strategic intelligence inspector responds to a call. A renowned physicist has voluntarily ended his life, leaving a note on the wall of his apartment. It was a countdown. Meanwhile, at Oxford University, a particle accelerator test is underway. The project leader, Vera, tries to send her colleague Saul home as the development is being shut down. Lately, voices of renowned scientists claiming that physics is not a science have been increasingly heard, which depresses the young scientist. Unexpectedly, Vera asks him about his belief in God, and upon receiving a negative answer, she goes to the huge reactor and throws herself down. Later, two friends, Augie and Jin, who are also scientists, discuss the strange events happening around the world. Saul recently sent a bizarre video recording of a phenomenon that is simply inexplicable from a physics standpoint. Watching the recording, Augie suddenly notices a strange flickering before her eyes. At the same time, the inspector is also puzzled by the strange deaths and notices five talented young scientists whom the deceased Vera once sought worldwide and involved in her research. A memorial service for the deceased woman begins in the church. Vera's friends and students express their condolences to her mother when Augie arrives. The girl still doesn't understand what is happening to her and what the flickering numbers before her eyes mean, and she suffers from it. The inspector also follows the ceremony and manages to film an elderly gentleman whom none of the attendees know. After the funeral, Augie goes out to smoke. She sits on the steps in a quiet alley, but her lighter is broken. Suddenly, a girl appears next to her, offering her own lighter and starting a conversation about life and God. Augie even takes her for a recruiter to a sect, but then the girl suddenly offers to stop the countdown ticking before Augie. All she needs to do is shut down her nanofiber research project, and tomorrow at exactly 12 o'clock in the night sky, she will see the universe winking. Then the recruiter leaves. We are shown again the year 1967. After her arrest, Wen Jia is sent to a secret radar base, where she will have to serve for the rest of her life. In the present time, the inspector manages to find out that the owner of an oil corporation, a very wealthy man named Evans, was present at Vera's funeral but tracking his helicopter was unsuccessful. Another oddity emerged. One of the deceased scientists had a very strange, shiny helmet, which intelligence failed to obtain. Meanwhile, Vera's mother gives the same helmet to Jin, who came to visit the woman. And then it turns out that Vera's mother is the same Wen Jie who was arrested in the 20th century in China. Later, Jin puts on the helmet and is transported to virtual reality. She finds herself in the middle of a desert, over which the hot sun quickly rises. Trying to hide from it, the girl steps on something that turns out to be the dried remains of a person. She gets scared, takes off the helmet, and returns to reality. An Ogi and Saul go outside this night, and at exactly midnight, the sky suddenly begins to flicker, as if the universe was indeed winking at people. Saul realizes that Ogi sees the numbers of the countdown to her death. In the morning, Ogi arrives at the Institute, and just before the start of the quantum experiment, she orders to turn off the equipment, and immediately the flashing numbers before her eyes disappear. The action again shifts to 1967. Wen Jia learns that her colleagues are actually searching for ways to send signals to the inhabitants of extraterrestrial worlds. She calculates the trajectory and suggests sending it directly to the sun. Reflected from the sun, the signal is greatly amplified and reaches the far corners of space. But being forbidden, the girl does it at her own risk. In the present time, the inspector shows Augie a video recording of her conversation with the stranger, who is not present in the video. It can be seen how a cigarette is lit, how Augie talks to someone, but there is no interlocutor, and there are no signs of editing. The inspector tells Augie about the flickering numbers, which were seen by other physicists around the world. Jin puts on the virtual reality helmet again and finds herself on the first level of a strange game. A man and a girl approach her, asking her to solve the puzzle of this world and lead her to a distant pyramid where a king is waiting for them. 
It is the era of chaos now, and the king needs to know exactly when the era of order will come. Besides Jin, the king has other scientists, but the one who guesses correctly wins. And if she is wrong, an entire civilization will perish. But then above the pyramid, the scorching sun rises. The man pulls her into shelter, while the girl remains under the rays of the sun and instantly dries up, turning into a bundle of flesh. The man gives it to Jin, explaining that in this form, the body can live until the era of order. The woman returns to reality and decides to ask for advice from a scientist and her friend, Rooney. He puts on the helmet and also finds himself in another reality, but the guard of the game beheads him, explaining that he was not invited. Frightened, Rooney takes off the helmet. He is sure that such technologies simply do not exist on Earth. While the pair discusses the game, the inspector listens to their conversations. Rooney, returning home, finds a package with a helmet and an invitation to the game. He finds himself in Old England and behaves quite rudely with the sir who meets him. Later, he excitedly tells his friend Will about it, and Will confesses that he is dying of cancer. Jin returns to the game and stands before the king, where her rival tries to guess the date of the beginning of order. She opposes guessing, as it is anti-scientific, but the predictor insists on his own and names a date. Then the predictor fast-forwards time to the era of order to test his mystical theory, and the day comes when the time of order arrives, and it is possible to bring the dried bodies back to life. Jin sees how the guards throw similar bundles, like the ones she has from the girl, into the water. Once in the water, they quickly absorb moisture and turn into living people. Her girl also comes to life. Everyone rejoices in the newly found life, but suddenly the sun begins to recede and a snowstorm hits the people. They try to save themselves, but freeze and shatter into pieces. Shocked, Jin remains alone in the middle of the icy desert. The appearing game guard explains that this civilization perished from the cold. Jin couldn't save them, but she established the superiority of science over mysticism so she can move on to the second level. The inspector reports to his boss, Wade, that in the 20th century, observatories around the world caught a strange signal, and one of them was the Chinese observatory. And in those years, the future millionaire Evans lived right there. It was then that Evans and Wen Jai met and realized that their views were very similar. On the same day, Wen Jai received a signal from space in which a representative of a highly developed extraterrestrial civilization introduced himself as a pacifist and urgently asked not to send signals into space because other civilizations would come and conquer their world. Reading this appeal, Wen Jie, embittered by the unjust death of her father, sent a signal into space inviting them to come to Earth and put things in order, because people cannot do it themselves. The action again shifts to the present time. Augie finds an alien virtual reality helmet in Rooney's house. She immediately tries on the strange toy and ends up in England, where she immediately dies at the hands of the game guard, as she was not invited. She rushes to her friends and learns that two of them are already participating in the game. Ogi is sure that this thing hacks the brain and asks her friends not to play anymore. But the pair, despite the promise, enters a simultaneous game. On the second level, they find themselves in England, where the same girl meets them. Here they are received by the Holy Pope, who also wants to know what era is coming. Jin scientifically proves that the planet that needs to be saved has three suns. When the planet revolves around one sun, the time of order comes. But the gravity of the other two suns pulls it off its orbit, and the time of chaos begins. The Pope does not like her conclusions and orders to burn the heretic, but then flames erupt outside, and a girl on a burning horse rides into the church. She screams that there are three suns in the sky and the world is perishing. Jin and Rooney are saved because they were right, as confirmed by the game guard. The civilization perished, but they understood the structure of this world system, so they can move on to the next level. The inspector realizes that the game is a tool for recruitment and searching for the best minds. Meanwhile, Ogi receives a warning of dismissal if she does not return to quantum research, and the scientist decides to resume experiments, but again the countdown to her demise appears. After that, Ogi finally stops the experiments. Jin and Rooney find themselves on the third level of the game at the residence of Kublai Khan, in front of which his warriors are lined up. Jin tells the Khan that this task is unsolvable, but another scientist begins to prove it, which is helped by giant human abacuses. 30 million soldiers turn flags to one of two sides. Rooney immediately understands. These are ones and zeros. This is a human computer. 
The program for calculating solar orbits is launched, from which it follows that the era of order will come in eight months. After fast-forwarding time to check the theory, the Khan, believing his court scientist, orders to throw the arriving pair into boiling water. But suddenly, three suns line up in a row, and the era of chaos begins. The civilization perishes again despite all the calculations of the court scientist. And then Jin realizes the goal of the game is not to save the planet, but to save the people. The game guard appears, confirming her conclusions, and invites them to the next level. Evans is informed about two new promising players, and he orders them to be invited to a meeting. After that, he returns to the conversation with the aliens, whom Evans calls the Lord. Evans tells the aliens a fairy tale about Little Red Riding Hood and the Big Bad Wolf, from which the aliens conclude that humans have lost their survival instinct since they have made contact with another civilization from deep space. The man reminds that it was done by one woman, and the Lord, after a pause, decides that fearlessness leads to extinction. Therefore, humanity must learn to fear. Jin and Rooney meet the recruiter, who congratulates them on advancing to the next level. Jin has realized the purpose of the game, and the answers to the rest of the questions will be found on the fourth level. The pair puts on the helmets and finds themselves in a desert. The game guard and the girl inform them that Jin was right. The three-body problem has no solution. Having three sons, the planet is inevitably doomed. Therefore, they decided to look for a new home. They built thousands of starships, and this is the last hope of their civilization. But without the help of Earthlings, they cannot survive, and the girl asks people to help her kind. The puzzled people take off their helmets, and the recruiter confirms that this is all reality. The aliens, the Santi, are already heading here, and they created the game to tell Earthlings their story and prepare for the meeting with new neighbors. Rooney considers this a lie and refuses to play further, while Jin receives an invitation to the meeting. Meanwhile, Rooney returns home, not noticing that the inspector is following his house. Rooney goes up to the second floor and suddenly sees the recruiter there, who pushes the guy onto a glass wall and kills him, and she disappears from the video. Friends learn about Rooney's death. The inspector reports that there is no image of the killer on any of the video cameras, and asks Jin to go to the meeting as a spy to arrest the killers of their friend. Later, the inspector reports that they found Evans's ship, on which he, along with a thousand followers, has been living in international waters for the last 30 years. That's why he is so hard to track down. At the same moment, Evans receives a warning from the Lord that his enemies know about the upcoming meeting. But there is no need to fear, his people will be protected. Evans calls the enemies pests, which he has to explain to the aliens, because they associate this word with bugs that can be simply crushed. Remembering the fairy tale about Little Red Riding Hood read to him by Evans, the Lord concludes that all humans lie, and they cannot coexist with liars. They are afraid of people. The Lord falls silent and no longer responds to Evans. Jin goes to the appointed place to meet with the followers of the aliens. The founder of their movement is invited to the stage, and Jin is surprised to see Wenjie. The woman begins her speech, promising salvation from the Santi, who will arrive in 400 years. But they need to prepare the earth so that the aliens can receive it as a gift. In the midst of her speech, the police burst into the room. Wen Jie orders her people to obey. But when the recruiter sees the police taking Jin away, she realizes that the scientist is a traitor and opens fire. Chaos ensues, people die, but their leader Wen Jie calmly watches it. Jin finds the inspector and takes her away. The detainees are put into cars, not noticing that the recruiter is not among them, who will return to the story later. On one of the days, the inspector interrogates Wenjie, who confesses to receiving a warning from the aliens and sending them an invitation to Earth, as humanity is incapable of saving itself. The Lord, that is, the aliens, allowed her to be captured because apparently she is no longer of any use. Evans turned out to be Vera's father, and Jin is needed by them because she is considered the best physicist. After Wade's report, they conclude that Evans must have kept all records of his negotiations with the aliens. But how to capture his ship? It's clear that while the special forces will be storming the ship, Evans will simply destroy all the evidence. And the ship is just approaching the Panama Canal, with the Lord still not making contact. The inspector asks Augie to help the government and resume the production of nanofibers. Together, they go to her laboratory, and the girl turns on the equipment. Contrary to her fear, the countdown to her demise in the case of developing ultra-strong nanofibers does not appear. 
Later, Wade, with the help of a team of naval soldiers, installs the system developed by Augie on the shore of the Panama Canal, disguising it as old columns. The girl suffers from a guilty conscience because of the children and women on board, but Wade reminds her of the fate of all humanity. And then the ship enters the canal. On Augie's command, columns with invisible, ultra-strong nanofiber strings rise above the water, but no visible effect is observed. And when the military already thinks that the technology does not work, the invisible strings start cutting everything that comes under them. The invisible death destroys metal and bodies with equal relentlessness. Evans, realizing that something terrible is happening, manages to take the disc with the recording of the negotiations, but dies in the ship's hold. The ship is carried ashore, where it crumbles into a huge burning heap. Later, the wreckage is searched, and the disc is found at Evans's corpse. Specialists of the administration try to decrypt it, and when they are already in despair, it suddenly opens. And the aliens themselves did it. Wade tells Wenjie everything, who is still confident that the aliens will help the Earthlings. And then the man lets her listen to the recordings of Evans's conversations with the aliens. The woman hears with horror that the aliens cannot live with humans because humans are liars. Later, Wade brings Jin to headquarters to show her the decrypted materials about a mysterious Sophon. In the movie plot, this is an elementary subatomic particle capable of moving at the speed of light. The woman suggests the chief put on a helmet and they find themselves in a desert where they are awaited by the game's guardian. She says that the aliens are not at all like humans and also reports that their species is doomed. They have to fly to Earth for another 400 years, but during this time, humans will manage to create the newest weapon capable of destroying the aliens because progress on Earth moves at a speed unimaginable for their species. After all, the Earth's world is stable, unlike the constantly dying planet Santi. That's why they decided to destroy Earth science for which they invented Sophon. There are more than three dimensions in the universe, which are folded in such a way that they are not visible, but Santi has the technology to unfold them. They focus unimaginable energy for humans on one proton and open it in a higher dimension, after which it becomes gigantic. And using this technology, Santi created artificial intelligence the size of an entire planet and reduced it to the size of an elementary particle. And now Sophon is demonstrating its capabilities on Earth. All of Santi's resources went into creating four Sophons, each pair of which are connected by the effect of quantum entanglement. Two remained with Santi, two were sent to Earth. Everything that people see and hear, the aliens see and hear simultaneously, even if they are separated by light years. Sophons have almost no mass and they are easy to accelerate to the speed of light. So they recently reached Earth and infiltrated all the laboratories where the planet's best minds work. So soon, science will be destroyed because instead of truth, people see wonders. The world is entangled in illusions. People see what Santi wants to show them. They are everywhere and constantly observe processes, revealing human lies. So soon, Earthlings will learn to be afraid again. Jin and Wade take off their helmets and exit virtual reality. Around the world, gadgets start to turn off. A message appears on all video panels calling people bugs, and the sky is covered with an unknown substance which transforms into something resembling a huge eye. And only the wounded but alive recruiter rejoices at this. Upon learning that aliens were heading towards Earth, the world was thrown into turmoil. Riots broke out, which the police and the army had to quell. Despite assurances that the aliens would not arrive for another 400 years, Earthlings are preparing to declare that they are not bugs. Funds are being organized everywhere to raise money to fight the aliens, although some believe in Santi's good intentions. On one such day, the inspector brings scientist Jin to Wenjie, who concludes that the professor is simply a traitor to the human race. Under the leadership of Wade, the main headquarters for the defense of humanity is being set up. He gathers the best scientists on the planet and announces the start of the war with Santi. Despite the aliens having sophons, humans have a chance. The first thing to do is to gather information, for which a probe will be sent to meet the Santi fleet. But for this, its speed must be no less than 1% of the speed of light. Hearing that scientists do not believe in such a possibility, Wade summons Jin and gives her the task of developing such a probe. And the girl does it. She arrives at the headquarters and demonstrates her idea. The probe must have a sail and get acceleration by following a predetermined trajectory where nuclear charges will be waiting for it. 
Of course, this will be very expensive, but it is possible. Meanwhile, stores start selling out of products and enterprising merchants have announced the sale of stars to collect money from billionaires. One day, friends gather at the home of Will, who is dying of cancer, trying to cheer him up. However, Jin has another goal, to persuade Ogi to create a sale of ultra-strong nanofibers for her probe, which her friend categorically does not want to do. But after Will's intervention, Ogi changes her mind, as the friend is convinced that it is being done for the common good. Jin realizes that the probe, upon reaching the Santi fleet, will not be able to slow down, to which Wade declares that the aliens will simply take it, as they will send in it a human head, that is, a brain. Later, Wade invites scientists to the laboratory, where a Russian scientist shows the results achieved by cryofreezing. The chimpanzee subjected to it wakes up safely and even demonstrates an intact intellect, after which Wade finally reveals his plan. He will go into freezing and will wake up from time to time to check how his plan for preparing to save humanity is going. At this time, Augie develops a new technology that allows making a huge and strong canvas of nanofibers, which will allow Jin's idea to be realized. The time comes when it is necessary to decide on the choice of the first person who will go to meet the aliens. A physicist scientist who is ready for death is needed. It turns out that Wade has long been thinking about Will's candidacy, who is dying anyway. Sometime later, Jin comes to Will and tries to dissuade him from participating in the flight, but the guy wants to bring some benefit with his death. Meanwhile, Wenjia confesses to Saul that her daughter died when she found out that her mother had called the aliens to Earth. Then she says goodbye and leaves forever. Will undergoes tests and refuses to sign the oath of allegiance to humanity. What if the Santi turn out to be better than people think? But it turns out that Wade needed a candidate loyal to the aliens so that they would definitely take him aboard. The wounded recruiter hides in a lonely trailer in the forest and one day the game warden addresses her from the TV screen. The Lord has not forgotten his followers and there will be an important task for her. One day, Saul goes to see off a friend, and when they stop briefly, a scooter flies at the guy. Saul falls and thus is saved from being hit by a car that has lost control. Later, the inspector informs him that in China, the recruiter killed Wenjai, and now there was an attempt on him, although Saul has no idea who needs it. Nevertheless, the inspector forces him to put on a bulletproof suit and takes him to the UN office, where the guy learns that today the launch of the program developed by Wade called Empty Gaze will be announced. The thing is that the alien Sophons can see and hear literally everything, but they are not able to penetrate a person's thoughts. Therefore, the management has chosen several people who will plan the strategy of victory, not revealing it to anyone. They will receive unlimited resources and will be able to carry out any ideas not contradicting the laws. Saul learns that he is one of the participants in the Empty Gaze Project and tries to refuse this honor, but the UN leader assures that there is no mistake and leaves. But at the exit to the building, he is shot at. Only the bulletproof suit saves him. Later, Saul asks to bring the killer to him. It turns out that this is a follower of the aliens, and he did it by order of the Lord's army. Saul still tries to refuse the position, but he seems to be not heard. Moreover, the UN secretary declares that no one knows why exactly he was chosen. Strange, of course, and who should know then? Then Saul asks to be taken to the Cosmodrome to see off Will. More precisely, what's left of him, his brain. And the recruiter finds an alien virtual reality helmet in her trailer and puts it on. Meanwhile, Will's head is placed in a probe that is preparing for takeoff. All 300 bombs are lined up in orbit and the countdown begins and the launch is made. At first, everything goes according to plan. The first stages were dropped. The nano parachute was activated. Acceleration begins. The first explosion was successful the second and third too. And suddenly there is an accident on the probe and it deviates from the trajectory. Jin is in despair and Wade leaves, whispering something to her. Later, he is on a plane where the game warden comes to him. The aliens recognized him as a strong leader and when they arrive, he will be part of their plan. They will always be nearby and will show him what he wants to see until his death. In the evening, Jin and Sol grieve by the pool when the inspector appears, orders them both to get into the car, and takes them to a place where an incredible number of bugs live. Because bugs are the ones who always survive, although they are poisoned and crushed. So the inspector suggests drinking to the bugs. And that's where the first season ends. 
The series is based on the first book by Liu Shixin from the Three Body Problem series. The world has already seen the Chinese version of the series, but Netflix loves to make series with its own vision. Moreover, there will most likely be a continuation.